to the cloud. Okay. So welcome to our first sort of formal and formal uh, vision science and medicine series seminar. And normally we are doing this about once a week during most of the summer at a lunchtime. Uh, traditionally, it would have been a Tuesday, it might be again as we get keep going. And we would have ERI faculty and some Beaumont clinical faculty giving us little presentations for our students and any other students who were interested. And let's see, I got another person entering now. And so we would start off always with this seminar. There'll be some other ones, and as I get them scheduled, I'll have that sent around uh, besides some bench science type information seminars during lunch times. We'll also have some clinical input, probably from John Hart and Lori Steck, who are ophthalmologists over at Beaumont. Uh, and we'll see things like anterior ocular surgery. Uh, Dr. Hart is basically director of training opth ophthalmologists in surgery at Beaumont and Lori Steck also runs medical training over there and is an ocular trauma expert and also does clinical trips uh, to Kenya uh, internationally. So today we're just going to start off with this lecture. It makes sense in the ERI for new people to have some kind of a reference as to where everything is in the eye and what it's relevant is to function and disease. So a little bit about the Eye Research Institute, uh, for those of you that might not be as familiar with it as I am, uh, we were really established here by Dr. Renzi and Kinsey in 1968. So actually goes back a long time. Uh, we're as old as the National Eye Institute at the NIH. And indeed, Dr. Kinsey is known as the, the, really the father of the National Eye Institute because it was his idea that there should be a National Eye Institute for vision researchers to have a, a portfolio to focus on vision research and for external uh, scientists to, to apply to NIH uh, within a vision context and, and focus. And so we're lucky that uh, he pushed for that and Congress made a National Eye Institute in 1968. And that certainly has benefited all of us in vision science. Uh, here's Dr. Kinsey in the glasses and with Dr. Pats, an MD. They got a Lasker Prize. You can look up the Lasker Medical Prize. They got it in 1956 for establishing scientifically that oxygen has a role that's important in retinopathy of prematurity. And that's Helen Keller giving them their uh, awards in this same ceremony. Uh, uh, Dr. Salk got his award uh, for basically doing the polio vaccine. If you want to see this trophy, it's up in our trophy case here in the fourth floor of Dodge Hall. Uh, I probably need to update that to 2021. We, we still had in 2017 aspects of research on cataract in the lens, retinitis pigmentosa, vitreoretinal diseases. Uh, also, we still do ROP related diabetic retinopathy, Norrie's disease, fever, which are vascular related type diseases for the most part. The eye, uh, just placing the eye in your skull, of course, we all, all know that basic point. Uh, the spherical eye is often referred to as a globe, and you'll hear that term used a lot. We have six extraocular muscles. Uh, one of them isn't visible here because it's a little bit hidden, the inferior oblique. Uh, there's some interesting uh, muscles on here. Uh, the superior oblique muscle, for example, actually loops through uh, basically a little ligament loop. And it's, it's kind of like a little pulley system. So there's a, a very good uh, complicated system, really uh, important provision, especially when we have two eyes, being able to focus and, and, and aim our eyes and our vision focus close and far on the same point in space uh, is, a, is a nice control problem uh, that biology has solved. But there are a lot of specialists that study really completely exterior, exterior features of the eye, as opposed to ones that you might think of normally that are studying interior features of the eye, uh, just as important. 
uh, ancient medicine refers to some of the most uh, ancient references in medicine that have been dug up in archaeology refer to three major internal components of the eye. Uh, there's an aqueous liquidy portion sort of in front of our lens. Uh, there's this crystalline material, which we know as the lens and call the lens now. And then behind it was a, a more jelly-like vitreous humor. And so they were referred to as the aqueous crystalline and vitreous humors. Uh, notice you're not very far from your brain. And indeed, you'll see that your retina is really kind of part of your forebrain. So the earliest surgery, actually, Egyptians used to take people with cloudy lenses and use small blades to sort of cut the lens free and let it fall down in the eye. And it's called couching. And, and that's actually still done in a couple places in, in Africa, uh, strangely enough. Uh, it, it's, it's not the best way necessarily to, to have it done, but uh, surprisingly, it, it is used as a, as a method where there's really no other advanced uh, ocular treatment. Uh, I always like to tell people that your, your brain is closer than you think. Uh, it, if you can move your eyes around, you're moving your brain. And that really speaks to the fact that developmentally, uh, our forebrain is basically forming up some of our sensory uh, neuron structures, including the ear, including the retina. And they form uh, in the embryonic blastocyst at the anterior uh, part of the embryo, uh, embryonic formation will kind of have us an invagination, you can see here, of the neural tube beginning, and neurectoderm will be forming here. And that's opposed to around here, we have a surface ectoderm, and I'll do a little movie here. I'm going to try to pause it in the right places, but you'll see there's going to be an optic vesicle is going to come out from this neural tube. It'll happen on both sides, and then the diagram will just show you one half and it's also going to form an optic cup when it invaginates. And this starts to form the multi-layer structures of our retina and also helps to target where the lens and cornea are going to form. So let me pause this. So you see how that's formed. And we have what are now called optic vesicles. And these are going to form an actual cup in a second when this folds in. And some of this surface ectoderm is now been highlighted with black. And, and this is going to be called the lens placoed region. Uh, there are also placoed regions that form on the surface that are going to have to do with, with hearing in the ear for auditory, but it happens also for the eye. And this tissue is going to actually move in and become uh, basically the lens of a future eye. And that process will continue. Now we're looking at one side and here's the cup. So you see this optic vesicle has invaginated and now we have what looks like a cup and obviously why it's called. Lens cells are the, the primordial lens cells are gonna start to form into the embryo from surface ectoderm. And there's interactions and communication between these cell types that are really coordinating this process. Of course, there's a lot of communication, biological communication happening. This is the formal folding formation, giving you this opposed bilayer. This one is going to be the future single layer pigment epithelium. And inside the optic cup, these cells are gonna become more and more retinal progenitor cells. They are gonna proliferate before they choose a cell fate. And this is gonna become a multi-layered tissue and then form layered structures with specific retinal cells in specific layers. And then basically that process will finish up to get to the eye that we know. So we've got a surface ectoderm producing the lens placode. We have uh, it migrating internally. We have the formation of, of a cup and we'll be able to get neural retina and retinal epithelium and cornea and sclera are formed from the surface ectoderm. And we have basically the final typical cartoon here of what would be the dimensions of a human eye. So here's another look at uh, just a different artist's conception. This is a review I, I worked on with Alex Speckle. Uh, you can find it in the journal Heredity. Uh, here again, you can see these other views of how you stepwise form 
uh, optic vesicles, optic cups, and just progressing more into a developed eye. Uh, this is a, a, a plastic section of a mouse retina. Uh, just to show you here that in a mature retina, you have a very ordered structure of, of, of layers. And we'll go over these retinal layers basically later on in, in this little talk. These are the kind of official acronyms we use and you'll be used all the time if you're a retina person, retina pigment epithelium, outer and inner segments of photoreceptors, outer nuclear layer, these are photoreceptor nuclei, an outer plexiform layer, we have synapses of the nuclei of the photoreceptors with bipolar neuron layers. Here's the inner nuclear layer has near, has mostly a bipolar cell nuclei. There are some Mueller cell nuclei hidden in here as well, an inner plexiform layer and a ganglion cell layer. So the retina, besides being a neural retina, of course, uh, it has also uh, a vasculature that has to form at the same time. Uh, and the vasculature has to be ready to go, especially when photoreceptors come online in vision. The retina and photoreceptors are really using more oxygen per cell at a higher rate than any other cell in the body. And without a good vasculature supply, you very quickly have an ischemic situation and the problems that arise from that. Uh, from where the optic nerve enters the eye is also where retinal veins and, and arter arteries and the capillary systems grow out from the center to the periphery of the retina. Uh, it's been well studied in rodents, uh, but basically the same process occurs in humans but of course in humans, this is all done embryonically before birth, whereas in rodents, uh, this happens really after birth, completely after birth. How that's guided developmentally is rather interesting. Uh, it turns out that astrocytes, a glial cell type, with their processes form a network from the center to the periphery of the retina, and they're giving off factors, some which include VEGF, that are guidance cues for endothelial cell precursors that are then proliferating and growing also from the center to the edge of the retina. So that's basically vascular development in a nutshell on the retina. And besides a superficial layer, there'll be two other layers uh, that form um, uh, an intermediate and a deep plexus in the neural retina. So here's some quick eye facts for people that might not be familiar with them at all. Your, your central detailed vision that you're watching this with today uh, is, is actually off the main optical axis of the eye. So the optical physical axis of the eye is a little bit closer to where the optic disc is, but because you can only get some of these structures in your central vision so close to the optic disc, that's really offset a little bit. Most bending or refraction of light might surprise some people, even though we have this object in the eye called the lens, uh, most of the refraction of light actually occurs at the air to cornea interface, because that is where you have the greatest difference in density. Uh, cornea and the lens are interesting tissues. They're clear tissues. They are avascular. Uh, they're gonna be getting a lot of their nutrients and waste product removal through a liquid called the aqueous humor, but basically they do not have a direct blood supply. The adult lens is, has in the middle of it are the oldest proteins in your body. There are proteins in your lens right now that basically were formed when you were an embryo. And probably, probably the proteins in your bone turn over faster than those proteins do, which is an interesting little tidbit of information. And as I told you before, the retina is really considered part of your forebrain and its endothelial barrier is also a high barrier endothelium like the blood brain barrier. So let's just go through some structures of the eye and I just take people from the front to the back. The tear film and conjunctiva. Uh, you don't think of those much unless you study or tear film and conjunctiva or unless you're an ophthalmologist with patients that have problems with these tissues, but they're very important. Uh, the tear film has three layers. It's about seven microliters on top of your eye surface at any one time. 
there are components that are lipid, aqueous, and mucus-like that are made from different cells and glands in different locations, uh, especially within your eyelid tissue, in your eyelid tissue. And they form, uh, you also have a very thin translucent mucous membrane called the conjunctiva. And it really starts at the, the gray area, uh, just around the clear part of your eye and connects all the way up and is contiguous, of course, with the inside of your eyelids. And that's important to have a barrier so that junk just can't get behind your eyeball and your eye. Makes total sense. The cornea, and that's actually a picture of my cornea. Uh, it has five basic layers. It's avascular and clear, as I've mentioned before. The gray transition zone from the cornea where it's clear to the white scleral part of your eye is called the limbus. That's very important, especially for a, an ophthalmic surgeon uh, because that forms a little landmark you can see outside the eye uh, and measuring backwards from this is a safe place, a pars plana, to poke instruments that are used for surgery into the eye to do vitreal retinal surgery without stabbing where you have retina and also without being too anterior and stabbing or damaging the, uh, the basically a, a ciliary body. Uh, the cornea is interested. It, it can be transplanted. It was one of the first transplanted tissues and uh, eye banks nowadays are able to keep donated corneas in culture for, for really a couple of months, two or three months and still use those to transplant corneas, which is quite amazing. Here's a, a look at the cornea with some microscopy sections from some journal articles. The air interface has a thick epithelial layer. There's a basement membrane called Bowman's layers. 90% you know, of the thickness of your cornea not shown here is a stromal tissue with collagen bundles that have keratocytes in them. On the inside surface, uh, next to the aqueous humor, is decimase membrane and a single layer of corneal endothelium. And these are just some three-dimensional uh, structures that are done with a, a really a, a scanning uh, laser microscopy, just to show you the kind of three-dimensional nature of the structures of the cornea. And this black band here you can see is decimase membrane. And here's the surface. Uh, these cells will grow back and proliferate and they can be damaged, they can be scraped away, uh, and they will grow back from the lumbal region on the surface of your eye, fortunately. Turns out that uh, there's a net flux of sodium and, and, and bicarbonate from the stroma across the endothelium into the aqueous humor. And that's always being pumped actively because it takes water with it. Uh, there's a natural tendency left on its own for your corneas to swell up and become cloudy white uh, unless you continuously have this very thin layer of endothelial cells pumping water out. It's a pump leak mechanism. Uh, it's also importantly driven by a sodium potassium ATPase and bicarbonate independent, uh, dependent ATPase energy using water pumps. Uh, a fellow named uh, Marie, Dr. Maurice and Dr. Riley, who is an emeritus professor from here, are two scientists who helped really discover and establish that that is how the cornea does this. So that's something that's importantly contributed right here from Oakland University. You need at least 700 of these endothelial cells per square millimeter to have pumping capacity to keep your cornea clear. A minimum of 1500 is usually used for a transplant use and uh, I think these days they've upped that, they usually typically have a few thousand or a couple thousand minimal available and they have been able to do that by improving corneal eye banking. So that's something interesting about that. Now the cornea and the sclera, they both have clericytes in them and they both have lots of collagen bundles. And one is white, as you can see, and one is clear. And, but structurally, if you pull them apart and analyze them, they seem to really have the same components. Uh, but the reason that the cornea is clear has to do that when you get to the cornea, these extracellular collagenous bundles are arranged 
in these very parallel uniform arrangements. And these are all tangled up within the white part or the sclera of the eye. But this kind of structure, even though all of these elements are large enough to be scattering light, uh, they kind of cancel out the scatter and, and make the and make your cornea basically clear. And it's called sort of a supermolecular order uh, that does that. The sclera is the white part of your eye. It's most of the surface of your eye. It's thinner in the front, thicker in the back. Your ocular muscles must attach into it. It needs to have some rigidity. The optic nerve exits the sclera through a, an area called the scleral formamen. Uh, there's a bunch of networks uh, of uh, fibrils that structurally like a net sort of cover this that all of the axons of ganglion cells sort of feed through the lamina cribosa to keep it strong there. And uh, even the sclera itself has different sub layers. And there are people that just study the sclera for whatever reason. The vascular sheet between the sclera and the neural retina, uh, RP and retina is called the choroid. It's kind of thought of as the middle layer of the eye, it has a very heavily vascularized bed and its innermost edge will be uh, a Brooks membrane, which is a basemal membrane that the RPE cells live on. And the iris and pupil, not to forget them. Of course, your pupil is just uh, an opening formed by the iris. It's a contractile diaphragm. It has two layers generally itself, at least two major layers, anterior and posterior. Uh, it has an avascular pigmented uh, region, has a, a, a basically a sphincter arranged musculature. Uh, there's a pigment epithelium and an anterior segment, uh, segment and it mingles with dilator muscles, which help pull uh, basically the curtain open as you were. And it becomes a tissue that's contiguous with what becomes the pigment epithelium of the ciliary body and the RPE. So you've got up here, I got your, your you have your, uh, excuse me, your iris. It's very contiguous with basically uh, the ciliary body and what will then also become your pigment epithelium, your, your retinal pigment epithelium as you go back in the retina. So the ciliary body is next to the vitreous. Uh, it has a very flat region here where you neither have retinal layers and you don't have ciliary body. And that's a pars plana region where surgeons can put instruments through. Uh, there are all these placata, which are just hundreds of little infoldings on the ciliary body. And they increase the area, surface area, because this structure is the structure where cells are going to be pumping in and producing aqueous humor in the eye. And let's just zip to this. So you have a, a strange kind of double pigmented, non-pigmented uh, epithelium here. And here you can see a tissue section of it. Notice that some of the cells are not pigmented and some of them are pigmented. Again, this has a water pumping system pumping aqueous humor into the eye. Again, Dr. Riley from the ERI helped to establish that this is something that happens physically with this tissue. Uh, they both have uh, opposed apical regions. And normally you think of the basal side of a cell as sitting on a basement membrane, but this non-pigmented epithelium uh, basically has its basal side technically not on a basement membrane. And together, these two cells will be producing pumping that basically produces aqueous humor. And we'll show you where that flows now in the eye. So in this region here in the red square, we blow that up. Aqueous humor basically gets produced and it's going to flow from here and exit in an area called Schlem's canal. So it, it basically flows into the aqueous humor section of the eye and we'll leave in what is called the angle of the eye. So the angle is formed by the iris at an angle with the cornea. And there's a trabecular meshwork network in here. There's aqueous outflow, 
with some outflow resistance. And there's actually a little circular region in here called Schlem's Canal, which goes all the way around your eye. And there'll be outflow into there and also continuing outflow from there. And basically a connection with a drainage system that is going to get flow back into a venous network. And then some of the flow will actually come out through the conjunctival area. So many people have an elevated intraocular pressure, which increases their risk for ganglion cell death or glaucoma. It's called a, an open angle glaucoma. And that is happens because you're, you're basically the, the cells in your ciliary body and the epithelium keep making and pumping in aqueous humor and you get an outflow resistance, you literally just start to pressurize your eye. And, and chemical pumps are just very strong. They will be able to pressurize the eye so much uh, that basically you will also really start to inhibit flow of blood through the retina vasculature, just because the eye pressure now starts to get so high, it exceeds basically the systemic blood pressure. Here's some uh, trabecular meshwork cells just stained with uh, for actin filaments. Uh, these are some I've done myself on primary cells when I was at the NEI many years ago. Uh, these cells you have a finite number of, they live on the trabecular meshwork. Some people have a, an early onset high intraocular pressure genetic condition, and they have mutations and proteins that are important to functions of these cells. Here they are close up. The lens. Uh, even though I'm a retina person, I, I've worked on the lens all through my PhDs. And as many of you know, Dr. Gilbin uh, focuses, excuse the pun, uh, on the lens here. Uh, the lens is an interesting organ in the eye as well. It also is like the cornea, uh, avasculature, avascular. Uh, it's, it's a little bit unusual organ. Uh, this is more of a diagrammatic structure, probably more based on a rat lens than a human lens, but the lens has an equatorial region. On the front of it is a nice uh, uh, layer of cells, a lens, uh, epithelial cells. They are really kind of migrating through your whole life to the equator region, and they're turning around. Their basement membrane is a capsule that encapsulates the whole lens like a little organ of its own. And these cells will program, programmatically on purpose, lose their nuclei, get rid of their organelles and pack themselves full of high density proteins called crystallins, and they will become clear ocular structures. And you're adding layers of these all through your life. So your lens gets a little bit bigger, gets a little bit older and stiffer. Uh, it won't accommodate focus as much, which is why all of us will one day uh, have reading glasses. You can't escape it. Even if you get LASIK to fix your nearsightedness, uh, you will one day need the reading glasses. It's the way nature goes. And it's an interesting structure and, and unusual. Lens membranes have a, a very high percentage of cholesterol in their membranes that you have to have. So, you know, cholesterol isn't always just a bad thing. Uh, like a single cell itself, the lens is this giant Borg-like structure of cells, uh, keeps its internal calcium uh, low and its uh, internal calcium high. And if you get any damage to the cell capsule at all, uh, you're basically gonna get a, a cataract because your lens calcium will go up, calcium activated proteases will then destroy uh, the structures you need for clarity in your lens. Some other little interesting structures here. Lens crystallins. The lens is so full of crystallins. If you just extract the protein and do a two-dimensional shell, do uh, a two-dimensional gel, and this I did at Virginia Tech a long time ago. What you can see here is, if you just do a Kamasi stain, most of the proteins that you detect are are basically uh, crystallins. Uh, the lens is interesting in the human eye. A blue light does not focus well in our eyes, something called chromatic aberration. So companies that use all these blue signs, uh, if you can't focus on them uh, and they annoy you, 
It's because the human eye does not focus far blue light very well. So let's look over the retina. So the retina has six major neuron cell types and, and it has a Mueller glial cell. There's really many, many, many more types of retinal cells if you want to go into subtypes, but far too many for us to talk about here today. But you can see we have rod and cone photoreceptors that are right adjacent to the retinal pigment epithelium. There are horizontal cells that exist in the retina. Here you can see a little green cell. They make horizontal connections in this neural network. We have bipolar cells that really are the main cells connecting photoreceptors to what will be uh, ganglion cells in the ganglion cell layer. There are amacrine cells, which are another type of cell uh, which uh, is all, are also studied uh, here uh, in, in uh, Dr. Zhang's lab. Uh, they make horizontal type connections as well within uh, the, the neural retina. And they do some other tricky things that, that some researchers are discovering these days. And we have ganglion cells. Now the ganglion cells, their axons bundle together and they basically form the optic nerve that is leaving your eye proper. And that's the basic structure of the neural retina, humans, other primates, cows, dogs, rodents, all have these basic structures in the eye. Light comes, many people are surprised, from this direction. Light goes through most of your neural retina before it hits the photoreceptor outer segments where rhodopsins and the conopsins are to do light detection. Developmentally, these are some, uh, this is a graph that shows in a rodent such as a mouse. Now they occur in the same relative order in humans, except this will all be done by the time uh, a human baby is born full term. Uh, in, in rodents, this occurs both embryonically and postnatal, shown in, in the age of days here. And these were worked out by very elegant experiments where people were labeling cells radioactively, radioactively. And then these hemispherical plots I've put on this graph represent the point where half or the major formation where half of these cells types have been born developmentally in time. And then the lines indicate a range of times where these cell types are being born. So for rods, for example, rod photoreceptors, half of them have been born by day of birth, and some of them will still be being born for a while after birth. And what I mean by these cells are born is that retinal precursor cells have done their final division. They've done terminal mitosis, and programs have now been set up within their networks of transcription factors that they are going to be faded to mature and become a functional cell at this type. So just because a cell is born and set its cell fate in the retina does not mean it's functional yet. So for instance, by day three in a mouse retina after birth, most of the rod cells have been patterned and selected to be rod cells, but none of them are expressing any phototransduction machinery yet, and there's no functional rod cells there. So cells will become a certain cell type. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap in time with when these cells are born, but also some tend to be developed earlier than others. Cones are set their fate early. Horizontal cells have their fate set early. Ganglion cells are already being formed uh, and they will continue to be formed for some time. Some cells are happening a lot later. Mueller, bipolar, and rods are technically still being born way out here at day 11 in a mouse. This is just to make the, the, the point that there's a lot of subtypes within a cell. So of course, within photoreceptors for humans, which are trichromats, we have long, medium, and short wavelength ops and cones. Uh, you know, we sometimes people refer to those as, you know, blue, green, and, and red, uh, short for blue, medium, and long for red. So we have subtypes of photoreceptors, but I also want you to show you in here in this web vision, this web vision website is a nice free learning website. I recommend that's updated 
Do you want to learn anything about the retina especially? There's all kinds of subtypes of horizontal cells, subtypes of amacrine cells, uh, and subtypes of ganglion cells. And there are many scientists who study these individual subtypes and can actually differentiate them genetically, physiologically, uh, electrochemically, uh, morphologically. This is a section of a human retina, just to show you a human one. Uh, all the retina main layers are labeled over here and little notes over here showing you where some of the, the cell types are. One thing primates have, which you should understand if you're using rodent models or almost any other model, uh, if you're not using a primate model, uh, many creatures do not have a fovea region. That's kind of unique mostly to, you know, the upper level primate uh, mammals. But uh, in the fovea, we basically have just cones. And these look rod-like in their outer segments, but that's because you're packing so many cones in there, they're, they're basically being just squished. Uh, basically, all the other layers that are normally on top of your photoreceptors exist, but they're all pulled to the side. And you can see the structures are all pulled to the side, out of the way. That really thins this part of the retina. Cones are not as sensitive to dim light as rods are. Uh, and so they're packed in here at high density. A lot of the structures of the retina and the inner and the inner layers especially are pulled out of the way so that you get good light sensitive transmission as much as possible to these cone outer segments in your central vision. These are just some electron micrographs to show you some of the comparisons of outer segment structures and rods uh, versus cones. And here's a blow up of some of the, the disc membranes. In rods, these disc membranes are separate pancake-like structures that are completely within the cell membrane and separate from the cell membrane. In cones, these discs are formed by invaginations of the cell membrane. So there's a little bit of a difference there. And here's some of the structures. I can provide this as PDFs for everybody to have if they want to refer to all this information later on. Uh, one thing we have happening for us during the day, especially in the morning, is we shed outer segments. And one important job is, this is where the retinal pigment epithelium is important, is photoreceptors cannot turn over uh, or get rid of their spent, used up, worn out outer segment structures, membranes, and proteins. These are phagocytosed by the RPE, broken down and recycled into biochemicals, uh, uh, just like normal, normal catabolism. But that's an important process that happens every day. It's, uh, it's on a biological clock. We'll have shedding happening uh, sort of earlier in the day for humans. In rodents that are nocturnal animals, uh, everything happens opposite at a different time for them because they're nocturnal. This is a nice little illustration of and if this movie plays, this is just kind of a pseudo illustration to show you how outer segments are formed in cones, which again are using specialized portions of the cell membrane. And this is a nice flyby that's also on the Web Vision site to give you an idea of the three dimensional structures of a rod cell. So here's all those nice pancake stacks of membranes. This structure here is, there's a, a, ciliar, a cilium type structure that transports lots of materials making these. This is very important in the photoreceptor. A lot of genetic diseases affecting any of these structures will cause retinitis pigmentosa or loss of rod photoreceptors. There's an inner segment region, which has all the organs and organelles of the photoreceptors and of course, we have the nuclei. And so this little region between the nucleus of a rod photoreceptor and to get to the inner segments can be short or long, depending on where this nucleus is stacked in the retinal layer. So, of course, in classic outer segments of photoreceptors, what you have is the classic protein rhodopsin, a seven transmembrane protein that's in the outer segment membranes. 
And this is the, the rhodopsin, of course, is the light detecting molecule of a rod photoreceptor. This diagram gives you a nice idea of where you are in the forest, so to speak, if you're a rhodopsin molecule. And of course, we have a 11 cis double bond when it's in cis, it's, it's cis retinal, that's Dr. Rhodopsin. Light absorption will cause this to go to trans and to be released and start off phototransduction. One important thing is uh, people need to know that happens biochemically in the retina is, is what we call the visual cycle. And uh, the visual cycle is not visual transduction. Don't mix that up with visual transduction is the process from rhodopsin through all the signaling that occurs just within a rod cell to start off your, your, your vision process. But the visual cycle refers to taking this 11 cis retinal when it basically becomes uh, uh, trans, uh, it has to be transported out. It, it's going to go oxidation reductions between the aldehyde and alcohol form. It's going to get conjugated to carrier molecules, transported to the RPE. It has to undergo basically transition to be back into the 11 cis retinal form, transported back out to photoreceptors where it can be used again for vision. So people that have defects in either photoreceptors or the retinal pigment epithelium in this process will also have blinding diseases of various names. This is just a diagram of some of the proteins and enzyme steps that are occurring up here in the RPE and in the rod outer segments to do that. So animals and research and drug development. Uh, this is just to make really the point in this slide that uh, a lot of drugs uh, that have been used and developed uh, and used in people now and also in animals. Of course, we have to do animal research. So we use a lot of rodents and mice, uh, but that's something that we do. Uh, I also like to note for people that in 2017, the first FDA approved gene therapy for an RPE65 mediated inheritable retinal disease came into being. And that happens to be replacement of a missing enzyme activity that you have in the RPE to help the visual uh, cycle. So just some basic quick overview of diseases that affect ocular structures and what they do to people's vision. We have normal vision, of course, you can have refractive errors. You've been wearing all the glasses, nearsighted people like me since grade eight know all about that. Uh, a cataract can also give you a focused fuzzy vision because your lens just scatters light and that can't really be corrected by glasses. AMD, age-related macular degeneration, had, tends to affect your central vision. Uh, diabetic retinopathy can affect your peripheral or central vision. And retinitis pigmentosa and glaucoma tend to affect a, a peripheral vision loss and central last, although that can progress to central vision loss. And, and so that's what people experience as a, as a patient. Here's a normal view called a fundus view uh, of the human retina. Here you can see the arcades of the veins and arteries entering the eye. Uh, the fovea, the macula and the fovea in the middle here are in a central kind of region in this image where you see you don't really get heavy blood vessels in there that would cause, you know, ocular, you know, would cause optical effects that would block your vision. Uh, that's a normal looking human fundus. You can see the, the, we exit in the optic foramen here at the optic cup. And here's an example of a, now we're looking more over at the, uh, at where we, we are leaving uh, the cup, the optic cup here. You can see, or the optic disc, I should say, excuse me, this optic disc. Uh, you can see these fine, fuzzy little vessels here. These are extra vessels, neovascular growth. These are vessels that have been formed in an adult eye after development. These tend to be leaky. Uh, they've been formed because there are areas that have lost their normal perfuse blood supply. VEGF levels go up. These sprout off existing vessels. They'll clot, they'll tear, they'll be damaging. You can see leaking areas here. 
AMD, you can see this motley spotted appearance here happening in AMD. Some of these spots have been done possibly maybe by some laser treatments around the periphery, but this is a damage now that's occurring in the macular region. And as you lose retina there, you will also get patches that look more yellow because literally this pink neural retina tissue can perish and die off and eventually affect your, your vision to different degrees of severity. High pressure, intraocular pressure uh, in a glycomatous eye, looking at the optic disc. Here you can see uh, these blood vessels. If you follow these major vessels, they, they kind of dip in. Normally these would kind of follow a, a little subcrater surface and then finally disappear. But as this eye is pressured, there's a, a cup to disc ratio. So we have the whole optic disc and then this cup region that goes down and, and where you're exiting the eye. Uh, normally this should be a, at a certain ratio, but if this cup region starts to get a little bit wider from pressure, that's something that an optometrist or an ophthalmologist can see and, and, and would be aware of right away to check your intraocular pressure that you might have high intraocular pressure. <laughs> Retinitis pigmentosa are inherited diseases. They cause the death of rod photoreceptors usually first. So here the disc region is here. The central regions of the, this person's vision is over here and is okay. So here we're looking at, at the periphery, which would be a nasal periphery of, of the right eye in this case. And you can see there's just complete loss of neural retina here where it's yellow. And photoreceptors die off. Uh, basically, the other neurons that support them may also die off. If a, if a problem occurs genetically in rods, you can have a, a rhodopsin mutation that causes your rods to die off. Eventually, you start to trigger cell death and apoptosis of other cells that don't uh, express the defect, like even the cone cells. Uh, ROP, I'll say something about, is a little bit of uh, something important to us because we kind of dis we, we also study the retinal vasculature. So before earlier in the talk, I showed you these astrocytes migrate out from the optic disc and they will help to form uh, a guidance cues for developing your vascular cells. But if you have premature birth as a human, you're born very early while this process is going on, this process becomes arrested in development. And what will happen is you might develop a retinal vasculature just say for the central portion of your retina. So this whole region out here in the periphery is going to become oxygen starved retina. And that causes the problem with VEGF going up. Uh, we study VEGF in my lab. Uh, this is a rat eye fluorescein angiography. If I inject some VEGF into there, that eye 24 hours later, these thicker primary vessels are veins. The thinner ones are arteries. It's the same in humans. And you'll notice they've actually gotten larger for a while and they'll, they'll go back to normal. Uh, but here we've given enough VEGF to disrupt the endothelial cell junctions. Veins are under pressure like little balloons. They pop bigger for a while until the junctions reattach and, and everything comes back to normal. And this is an optical coherence tomography system we use to, to look in at the layers of the retina without having to take out an eye. We can just see right through the cornea all the way through the retina. And you can see here how this vein we're watching gets bigger for a while and then recovers. So of course, when you have oxygen starved retina, glial cells pump out vascular endothelial growth factor and endothelial cells will respond to those and become activated and in human eye diseases, uh, such as diabetic retinopathy and AMD, this is one molecule that will help spurn the formation of neovascules, neovessels, neovascular growth, which are really just tubes of endothelial cells that do not get properly formed with peripheral parasites on the outside of the vessels. So your blood vessels don't become nice, patent, normal developed vessels. They become these temporary they, they'll bring oxygen to a region, but they're very leaky, damaging, easy to damage blood vessels. And so you just get other commons, com, 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 you get other compounded problems from bleeding, tearing, uh, fibrotic, fibrotic formations. 
uh, of, of tissue in the retina. Genetic diseases of the retina, uh, I'll just say that there, there's all kinds of them in genes and we study and sequence them in here in certain diseases in the ERI, deletions, frame shift, point mutations. Uh, mutations can affect transcription factors, structural components uh, of photoreceptors, proteins that form the visual transduction cascade, rhodopsin, arrestin, uh, uh, PDE6B. Uh, there's many, many disease categories. Over 300 disease loci have been mapped, uh, and there's been a constant discovery rate of them. If you ever want to follow those, they're summarized at a nice website for RetNet. RetNet. You can just Google RetNet. And this is a little map uh, up to 2019 anyway of how disease genes are identified in retinal diseases. Uh, and at first, in the early to late 90s, we were mapping many more diseases in human families. And blue just means you, you know where they are in a chromosome. Red means they've actually figured out what gene it is and what the mutation is. And as you can see, we're always discovering enough new ones that even though they're identified very quickly these days, having the human genome and genetic techniques available, there's always new mutations being mapped, in, even in disease genes we already know about, because people are having different mutations formed all the time in the human population. But because vision science uh, is rich with this genetic eye diseases, eye diseases don't necessarily kill you. They let you form a normal human being that survives in the universe. Uh, the vision science field has just naturally been a source for human genetics, where a lot of human genetic studies and techniques have been developed. A, a lot of that just has been done in vision science. So if you have heart defects, kidney defects, uh, neural defects, uh, those are arising all the time in embryos too. But if they don't make a viable creature, you just don't have those people walking around to study genetically. Uh, Gene Bennett, uh, some Gene Bennett is somebody important to know who's at CHOP in Philadelphia. Uh, she did some of her training in ophthalmology uh, in the Southeast Michigan region. Uh, got some RD mice from researchers at here at one time, but uh, Dr. Gene Bennett is famous in the field as really being the physician scientist that pioneered the first gene therapy in humans. Uh, that has come to fruition these days. Uh, you can see a free talk by her if you look for Arvo 20, 2014 talk by Dr. Bennett. She gives a wonderful plenary talk with other people on how to bring gene therapy into medicine, which was very difficult to do, but something that was funded and spearheaded by uh, NEI funding and vision science, which really benefits all of medicine. This is just, I'm going to leave you with a little map of targets of the major eye diseases and what parts of the eye that they're, they're hitting. Worldwide, cataract blinds the most people in the world uh, because not everybody's in a part of the world where they have cataract surgery, outpatient surgery to get an intraocular lens. Within the developed nations, such as US, Canada, uh, many Asian countries, the UK, EU, uh, AMD and diabetic retinopathy are causing most blindness. In, in Americans, every year, most new cases of blindness are caused by diabetic retinopathy. AMD's a close second. Glaucoma is also a big cause of blindness in Western developed nations. A lot of people do have retinitis pigmentosa, but uh, the genetic diseases of the retina, including the ones we study, you would really call an orphan disease. They are considered in medicine to be rather rare in the population. And so uh, they're, they're, they don't, they blind thousands of people every year, but uh, hundreds of thousands of people become blind from AMD and, and diabetic retinopathy. And so if you're wondering what diseases to work on to have a biggest impact on blindness, that gives you an idea about those, uh, those diseases. This is just uh, gonna finish up. Uh, I will create, uh, I'm gonna, be recording this, at, well, I am recording this, and I'll find out when I'm done here if, if, uh, if Zoom did a good job of it. But I'll, I also will make a PDF of this 
if anybody would like a PDF of these slides, all nice in color and have this to refer to, just please drop me an email, mitten at oakland.edu. I'll be happy to send you uh, slides of that, of the talk. And then I'll end the talk and see if anybody has any questions while they're here for a few more minutes. I've kept it within the hour. It's only 1254. And so for my students who are new to the eye uh, and any of you who are somehow working in the eye, so uh, uh, some of you are doing retinal organoids in biology, uh, there's a, an introduction. All I can tell you and pack into a quick hour on ocular development and diseases. Hi, Ken. I have a, a quick question and observation. A very good talk. I really, really appreciate it, and I get a much Everything better. Everything you want.